All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for attending the, uh, the, the Vita Summer Slam 2017. Uh, before we introduce uh, Ms. Fitzhugh, we're going to do a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, we, we have a, a couple of things that we need to uh, impart upon you. So, we have a Slack channel. Um, if you want to become a member of it, we have some really good channels in there, a lot of good conversations. A lot of the things that we've been learning from the community have been coming out of the Slack channel. So advice on the website, what kinds of things you guys want to see in the future. Uh, we've been doing some polls and stuff. Uh, if you want to, send an email to info at vtub.com. We will get you added to the Slack channel. Come on in, get in the conversation. Um, we have the giveaways this year is going to be either an iPad Pro, a Surface Pro 4, or a Samsung Galaxy 8. Not all three, obviously. If you will, um, go to the registration desk and drop your business card off, and we'll get you squared away for the drawing at 4 p.m. The lobster bait bracelets this year. So those are going to be given away after lunch. If you are here and you want to go to the lobster bait, you have to have a bracelet on. Those will be after lunch. Don will be handing them out at the registration desk. We are only going to be giving out one bracelet per person. Please don't ask for 17 bracelets for, for your friends that weren't here. <laughs> Um, so, with that, uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce Ms. Fitzhugh. She spent five years in the Marine Corps. She is VCDX number 243. Um, she is one of four female VCDXs. She is a three-time, a two-time author, We're working on her third book right now. And I met her, I met her three years ago at, at uh, VMworld. And, and I, I met her, and I, and I didn't know of her. And then afterwards, I started seeing all these books by her. <laughs> so, without any further ado, Rebecca Fitzhugh. Thank you. Technical things happen. Magic. All right. So, good morning, everybody. Um, Going to talk about rearchitecture. So I'd like to kind of start off uh, by introducing myself, if you do not know me. Uh, so as Chris mentioned, my name is Rebecca Fitzhugh. I work at a startup called Rubric, if you have heard of it. Awesome, if you haven't, you feel free to talk to me afterwards or those guys over there. So, uh, so without further ado, let's get into it. So we're going to go on a little bit of a magical journey today. Um, I hope you're prepared. So there is a point to all of this craziness that we're about to go through. He's giving me directions. Stage directions I do not understand. It's pointing to things. Alright. So we keep hearing this idea of like IT, architecture, and art. Who's heard this metaphor before? This is not the first time you've heard this comparison, right? Art and IT architecture. And there may even be somebody in the audience here somewhere that wrote a book called The Art of IT Architecture. Right? So what is the correlation? So at the end of the day, they take planning, they, they take a lot of effort, and they should be something that when you're finished, you walk back and you go, wow, that's awesome, right? That looks amazing. It's like the same sense of satisfaction that you get whenever you walk into a data center and it's perfectly cabled. You know what I'm talking about, right? Everything's perfectly tied, it's all color coded, uh, and you go, wow, that's awesome. Versus when you look at it, it just looks like spaghetti mess. Right? That's still some form of art, just like IT architecture. Who in here is familiar with Bob Ross? Yeah. Who likes Bob Ross? Yeah. Now I'm gonna ask a really important question. Who thinks that he is a good artist? <laughs> Two people recently. I'm sorry to, yeah, I know that guy. Uh, so I'm sorry to disappoint you. He's kind of not, right? We all like him. He's a cool guy. Like, we want to drink with him. But, I mean, he's dead, but you know. <laughs> we would have. Uh, but the reality is that he's not necessarily a good artist. Like, sample A. Beautiful. Right? Trees, mountain, water. Grass. Here's another different piece of art. 
by Bob Ross. Mountains, trees, water, green stuff. Cool. Sample three. <laughs> Mountain, tree, water. <laughs> Are we sensing a theme here? They're exactly the same. There's nothing different or innovative about this at all. In fact, look at that smile. So actually, my, I was telling one of my best friends about this discussion I was going to have, and she was like, you're going to deeply offend everybody if you go up there and say Bob Ross sucks. <laughs> I was like, thanks, thanks. So I actually did a ton of research on Bob Ross, found out a lot of fun facts. Like, did you know he was a 20-year Air Force veteran? That's awesome. Did you know that his hair is actually straight? <laughs> he burns it. It's burn. It's not real. It's all fake. Right? Um, but he is like the idea of like following a vendor validated design exactly. Who's done that? Oh, a couple of hands. Yeah, I'm disappointed. Okay. Um, if you implement it exactly, why? How does that meet your business requirements? Right? It's a general design that has all the bells and whistles, all the features, all the things, all the products. How is that meeting your business requirements at all? To me, it just sounds expensive and kind of pointless. Right? I told you I did a lot of Googling on Bob Ross, right? I found somebody, some, math, some, some person much smarter than me who likes math a whole lot more than I did did a statistical analysis of his artwork. Trees are every painting almost. They're like 90 some odd percent. Where if you go all the way down to the bottom, like he's got two paintings, or two percent of his paintings have a bridge. Right? But there's a lot of commonalities. Especially when you look at the top, it's like clouds, trees, water, every painting almost. Right? That's kind of boring. In fact, his methodology is so repeatable and boring and bland that you can become a certified instructor. Did you know this? <laughs> you can become an instructor the Bob Ross method and you can go and teach people to paint exactly the same trees in the happy clouds and the water, right? In fact, this was the most unique painting I could find from Bob Ross. And it still has trees and water. So it's still not really that unique besides it being a different color. But then Picasso. We're all familiar with Picasso? Yeah. You know, I thought about picking Van Gogh as my, my other option, but then I was like, I'm just going to go on a weird tangent about him cutting his ear off for like 55 minutes, and I'm going to lose everybody. So I was like, oh, I'll go Picasso. Seems more PC-ish, if you know anything about the history of Picasso. So, here's a piece of art. Kind of unique, interesting. Here's a different piece of art. Here's another one by Picasso. There are similarities. Right? There are similarities between these three. For example, he uses a lot of sharp edges, not a lot of sharp lines in his artwork. Right? Notice like the arms and the elbows, there's a lot of sharpness there. Uh, he kind of straddles the idea of like 2D and 3D art because it looks different here than it does when you're looking directly in front of it. Right? So there's again similarities. He has a clear methodology, but at the end, everything is pretty unique. Right? So we have vendor validated designs that are here is an exact design from start to finish with all the bells and whistles and all the things here follow this do it and then you have reference architectures right and there's a difference a reference architecture is meant to be kind of a general framework have basic ideas basic tenets that you can follow but it's not meant to be followed exactly it's meant to give you an idea of how it could be implemented an idea of what's required to implement it and then you fill in the blanks Right? So a reference architecture has the technical specifics, right? what does this require, and it gives you the idea of some ways that it could be used, right? the use cases. But at the end of the day, everything ties back to the business. What does the business require? What does the life cycle look like for that business? What is the business model? And that overlaps your technical architecture and your customer context, and that's where the reference architectures come into play. So it's exactly this idea, right? Cool. It's a basic framework. I have no idea what this house is going to look like, but I know it's going to have sides and a roof, and I know it's got a solid foundation. Cool. 
What it could look like is this. I actually Googled dope houses. And that's okay. That was like option number three. And I was like, yeah, I like that. This is very unique, right? This is a unique house. It's interesting. It's different. It probably custom built. And it probably got everything that person wanted and needed. Right? I need three bedrooms. I need this. I need that. And I want this extra stuff on top of it. Here you go. Or you could buy a track house that looks exactly the same as the next door. Exactly the same as the next door. My sister lives in one of those big Texas McMansions. I, every time I go see her, I can't, I don't know which house is hers. I just keep driving until I see her car. Right? Because every single house looks exactly the same. That's a, that's a validated design. Right? That, and that's somebody implementing the validated design. Exactly. So let me ask you, who has upgraded recently? It can be upgraded vSphere, upgraded your hardware, upgraded literally anything in your environment, the application, right? All of us. Cool. Did you change anything besides the version? Who changed something besides the version? Oh. Okay. So notice that the amount of hands is far less this time, right? Almost everybody raised their hand when I asked who's upgraded, and then when I asked who changed anything besides the version of the application, it was maybe 25% of the audience. Who's using mainframes still? Don't be ashamed, you can tell us. Yeah, yeah. There were like definitely four hands minimum that just went up. You guys know it's 2017, right? I just want to check that Bob Ross is dead, so is Picasso. Okay, just checking. So what I'm getting at here with those questions is you can't fix a problem by simply just throwing hardware at it. Have we figured that out yet? We might have in this room, but a lot of businesses haven't figured that out. We have a couple of consulting architects in here, right? I've seen a couple of VCDX, they're awesome. This is a challenge that we face all the time, going into customers, talking to customers. They go, okay, so we're just gonna add more hardware, new hardware. We're gonna upgrade from vSphere this to vSphere that. They go, great, what are we fundamentally changing? Nothing. Fundamentally changing nothing. What is the point? Right? Obviously, you don't want to go end of life, so you upgrade, right? You want to have support and services, so you upgrade, great. But are you still meeting your business requirements? Right? Because who implemented that design, that infrastructure, versions and versions and versions ago? I've definitely been in environments where they you know, installed originally VI 3.5, and now they're on vSphere 6.5. You know what changed between 3.5 and 6.5? New hardware? New version, nothing else changed. The design is effectively still the same. So the design that you implemented 3.5, is that still meeting your business requirements in 6.5, especially as the business has changed and evolved over the years? Probably not. So whenever we need to do any kind of change, upgrade, anything like that, we still need to follow methodology. Now you don't just get to go, ah, yeah, just install next, 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 down, done. Right now I'm newer version, great. Ideally, we still need to stop and assess what are the requirements of this business? What are the requirements of doing this? Am I meeting the business requirements currently? How can I meet the business requirements as a part of this upgrade or as a part of this change? Right? And we do that in the design phase. Because all of those nerd knobs and bells and whistles that you have in the physical design, in your actual implementation, at the end of the day, they all go back to the conceptual piece of, is the business requirement being satisfied? Yes, no, okay? So we need to make sure that we're actually tying it back. So, you ready? Did we, everybody print off their buzzword bingo? No? I don't know, because you're about to get bingo, right? <laughs> so we always hear like, oh, we want our businesses to be more agile, right? We want to have our applications packaged, easy, implement. We want them to be more secure, this whole ransomware thing, right? We want mobility, we want agility, we want virtualization, the cloud, all these fun things, right? But how do we get there? Because how many people raise their hand with mainframe? Four or five people are still using mainframes. So how do we go from this traditional infrastructure and architecture, right, this legacy environment, and get here, right? And so you need to stop and really understand what is the roadmap? And what do I really want to get out of it? And then you need to decide whether re-hosting or re-architecting is going to be right for you. Right? And 
And a lot of times we end up just rehosting. So why not re-architect? When should I re-architect? Right. So are we familiar with these terms, re-architect versus rehost? Hmm. Maybe. Yes, no. So in case you aren't, uh, rehost, this is effectively lifting and shifting. Lift up what I have, change what's underneath it, drop it back down. Right? Or pick up what I have on premises, put in cloud. Right? I might make some changes, right? Because now oh, I upgraded, now I have to change what port group this virtual machine is connected to. Right. But you're fundamentally not changing what's running inside the application. And you're not fundamentally changing what the application is uh, residing upon. So re-architecting is you fundamentally changing that design. And that can be at an infrastructure level, it can be at an application level, and that can be both. Right? Who in here has applications that are custom? Right? Custom developed, homegrown apps. Quite a few people. When's the last time you actually sat down and figured out when the last time that virtual machine was, or the that application was changed? When was the last time there was a code change? When's the last time that there was code change, which probably fairly recently, and then you sat down and went, hmm, should I change the way this machine is configured? Should I run it, change what it's running on? A lot of times we don't do that, right? We upgrade, we change the, the, the application itself in terms of versions, but we don't go back and wonder how is it re-architected? And how should I re-architect my infrastructure to meet that, right? Who in here loves VMware? Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I'm about to offend all of you. Are you ready? I love it too, but the most important thing that I hope you get out of it, this entire discussion is this. No one cares about the infrastructure. It's about the application, right? It's all about the application because it's all about the users at the end of the day. At the end of the day, the application is the most important piece and it's consuming resources. And those resources are the infrastructure, and the infrastructure is effectively just a dumb endpoint. I consume from endpoints. Great. Is the app running? Is the app accessible? Is it available? Am I able to have my user access it and generate money for my business? Right? So I'm sorry if I offended you. Okay. VMware is important, but the application is more important. Things are changing. Fair? Fair statement? Right? We keep hearing about this mythical cloud thing and we're all going to it by 2017, right? Okay. We actually, it was 2015, but none of us made that deadline. We're all late, right? So 2017 is going to be the year of, the, of cloud, right? This is also the year of the Linux desktop. Yeah. And VDI, right? Okay. So we, we do know that things are changing and we're slowly, slowly getting there. Okay? Has anybody seen this image before? I didn't create this. Okay? So people are platform. People are the platform. That's what we're trying to meet and maintain. Okay. So this is the part that, this is the world that most of us live in. Are we all on the infrastructure side or most of us on the infrastructure side? Yeah, me too, right? That's the world we live in. And that application has usually some kind of interface, some way that the users connect to it. And then we have the people. And at the very tip, in the very top of our pyramid, we have the business. It's all about generating revenue making sure that the business is healthy so that I'm getting paid, right? The business doesn't care about IT, we know that. The business cares about the users and the customers. Therefore, we need to care about the users and customers. So how do we do that? At the application level, okay? So, who's seen this one? Come on, I stole these right off the internet. <laughs> I'm not that smart, come on guys. So, we need to change with these expectations. We know that the expectations are changing, therefore we need to change with it, right? So on the last slide, I said people are platform. Who in here uses some kind of app on their phone? Yeah, me too. We all have smartphones since 2017, right? Um, I don't cook. I don't ever plan on learning that skill, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, therefore, I use Uber Eats a lot, DoorDash a lot, all of them. I have all the food apps on my phone. There's an entire folder called food. You know what I care about? I care about opening the app, searching, finding a restaurant, and then realizing that it's closed and then getting really pissed off, and then going and finding another restaurant, right? Selecting what I want, entering my credit card information, 
and that being securely transmitted, received, and then my order magically getting delivered to my house within 65 to 75 minutes. That's what I care about, and that's what makes DoorDash money. Right? Do you think that me as a user, do you think I really care what version of vSphere you're running? Do I really care if it's hosted in AWS? I don't. Right? That's a problem that we have to solve and move on to figuring out how that application is going to be best suited. So we've moved from this idea of a reliable and available infrastructure, that traditional IT, mainframe, shout out, right? <laughs> we moved to the age of virtualization, and a lot of us are still living there. Okay? And now we're moving to the cloud, right? This, this idea. And from there, everything is as a service now, right? X as a service, everything. Platform as a service, application as a service, DR as a service. That's where we're going, and that is our application evolution. Make everything easier and more fundamentally available to the end user, okay? So we're somewhere between faster and everything as a service. That's where the technology world is. How many of us are actually there yet? That guy, one guy, one person raised his hand. Yay, two, okay, three. Three. So three out of everybody. Okay. That's a problem. It's a problem. Okay. So how do we get there? Well, all of us just admitted at some point that we're more on the infrastructure side, including myself. So how do I get myself to this point where I'm becoming more application-centric? A couple of ways. Right? So the first thing is actually understanding the application. Part of re-architecting is looking at the application and how it works. I'm not saying that we all need to become coders overnight, but that wouldn't hurt. Right? It wouldn't hurt to learn some kind of language because I need to understand how that application operates. That way I can understand what is the best deployment of that application. Great, I just uh, upgraded SQL from this version to that version. And now I have a single instance of it. Would it be better to be distributed? Or should I take that distributed architecture that I have and roll it back up into a single instance. How do I understand that? And I need to go back and look at these things like reference architectures and figure out for that from that framework where I should be moving to to meet the business needs. Okay? Infrastructure development. Have who's heard this term infrastructure as code? A couple of people, yeah. So are we getting there? Maybe, maybe not. Right? But the entire idea of DevOps is that it's a culture, right? It's an idea that we should be sharing information and we should be looking at things more from the level of how it actually works under the hood with coding than this high level of, oh great, virtualization. What does it do? It solves problems. I can now run multiple things on one thing. Magic, right? And then of course, embrace change. So really, we need to make sure that we're not standing in the way of progress. Fair? Right, so don't be the dinosaur. Don't be the guy who's like, well, that's how we've always done it. We're girl. Right, that's how we've always done it. That's how we're going to continue to do it. That doesn't protect your job. That puts you in more danger of losing your job than evolving and changing. So what do I need to be thinking about? Right? APIs. Extensibility. How does it all work together? How can I automate it? Because right, that's what we're moving to as a service. We want to have this single endpoint that I'm consuming from, and as a user, I just want a self-service portal where I go in there and I get exactly what I need from the application. Right? So we need to be looking at things like APIs. And we always hear the term software-defined data center, right? The SDDC. What is the real SDDC? Well, truly, if everything is software-defined, then that should be application-centric, right? because that is the initial idea when we think of software, is what software am I running in that virtual machine on that physical server, right? So we need to be focusing more on the application itself. Look at new methodologies, new tools. Who in here has heard this idea that like, ah, Docker, it's gonna fail? Nobody's heard that? Oh my God, I hear all the time when people are like, I've got vSphere running, I'm never gonna replace vSphere with Docker. Why, why, why would you? Why can't they run side by side? Couldn't, isn't it possible that there is a use for containers in your infrastructure along with your traditional virtual machines? Isn't that possible? Right. And then we need to be looking at policy-based management. Yes, every application is a unique snowflake, right? 
and we should be treating it as a unique snowflake. But there are commonalities between, because this maps back to your business model and how the business views tier one applications versus tier two. So we need to be getting to that policy-driven world because that's going to make our lives easier when it comes time to automate, right? Because then I can group things and go, great, this is a tier one application, here's how I automate it. So how does this all go back to the idea of re-architecting? Because that's what we started with, right? I told you we're going on this magical journey at the beginning. So now we're nearing the end of this magical journey, so let's tie it back to the beginning. Ultimately, at the end of the day, the next time it comes time for you to re-architect, you need to stop and look and reevaluate and determine, should I change the way my architecture is set up? Should I change the way the application and the virtual machines are designed? And the answer there, honestly, might be no. You might go, everything is running well, everything's meeting the business needs, it's fine the way it is, let's upgrade. But the answer there might be, we could do it better. So do it better, right? Why not do it better? So, don't be this guy. I know he's very alluring in this picture. He knows this nice but he's not, I mean, come on. We saw the pictures at the beginning. They're all the same. He's basically just painting by the numbers tree. It's happy. Look at this happy tree. Cloud. Great. Wonderful. It's really boring. Okay? So think outside the lines. Right? Think differently. Think of how things could change. Are you guys ready for a video? I thought, what better way to end than a rap battle? So let's do this.